All right, so how do we deal with all this, you know, quantum weirdness? There has to be some explanation for all this stuff, right, that we've been going through with the late choice con race and whatnot. And so what is the weirdness we need to deal with? Well, the things that popped up is the weirdness of the steps in the quantum world. It's, it's why we call it quanta, because they move, when they do act as particles, they move from one stage to the next, as if there's no space in between. It's like, here's picture one in a movie, here's picture two in a movie, and there's not an infinite amount of things in between. It's more like a movie. And that's how these things work, but shouldn't it be a continuous line where if a particle's going to move in an arc, shouldn't it move in a continuous line? But it doesn't. It moves in stages. And there's nothing between those stages. It's as if time ceases to exist and the particle went from here, from stage one, to stage two. It's as if, it's as if the person, me or you, went from uh, running, like we're going to, we're going to, I don't know, go from here and then all of a sudden we're here and it's just a big quick jump I don't know if you can, I don't know if you can see that but let me get it close to the camera for just a second uh, like that right so that's what it's like because as if you're just making this big jump this big leap from one frame to the next and there's nothing in between there's literally nothing in between that's how the quantum world acts. It, it, it acts in bits. Okay, so that's one weirdness we need to deal with. And and I'm just going to say now, the, way that, the one way to actually deal with all this quantum weirdness and the weirdness of the universe is to believe in some sort of digital physics. So we'll get to what digital physics is in just a moment. Kind of the, the word, the phrase itself kind of makes sense, but or tells you what it is. Okay, so the next thing we need to make sense of is how in quantum entanglement can information travel from A to B, which is, you know, eight seconds apart is in light years, so if you're traveling the speed of light, it would take eight seconds to get from one place to the other. And if you have two entangled particles that are separated that far apart, how is it possible that I can know that this, well, I can take a measurement on this one, which becomes Z plus, which makes it exist in a state. Remember, particles don't exist in a state. That's another thing, that's another weirdness we need to explain. How can it be that an electron or a photon or any particle can exist as a probability wave Right, and, and we can also represent the wave like this. Because this has a probability wave, so the particle exists somewhere on this probability wave until it's measured, or in some real way being acted upon in, in the real, real universe where it has to become a particle. It's, it's acting with the universe in some real way where it has to act as a particle, and then only then begins to exist and begins to act as a particle. That's another weirdness we need to explain, that there's this probability wave, a wave that exists in nothingness. And then, how, because particles have that probability wave function, how can it be that these are, you know, these A and B is very far apart, and they have this entangled, they both have a piece of an entangled particle, or they both have an entangled particles. Once Bob makes a measurement on his entangled particle, you automatically know that the other particle must be in that existent state, but opposite thereof. So if this is plus Z, that must be minus Z. But how is it possible that just by making a measurement on this side, on this on this entangled particle for the z, that instantaneously that particle must be negative z. How is that possible? That doesn't seem very possible. And this has been shown to be true. They have separated people far enough apart, had each one conduct the experiment very short together, but but at slightly different times. And sure enough, the the experiment's always the same. You know, if he measures his z, hers will be negative z. If she measures a negative z, his will be positive z. It's always that way with entangled particles. So how can they somehow, remember, prior to being measured, they exist as a probability wave. They don't exist as up or down. They don't exist as negative or positive z. They don't exist as negative or positive x either. They don't exist in any of those states. They exist as a probable negative and positive. They exist as probability. There's a probability function there. This isn't even a wave. See, the up and down state of the particle is not a wave function. It's some other kind of function. And the function de determines whether it has an upspin or downspin, a top spin or bottom spin. But that's weird. There's a probability function. And, the, and it doesn't exist in either one of those states, or you can say it exists in all of those states, until you make a measurement upon it. When you make a measure upon it, then it has to exist in one of those states, and therefore its entangled particle must exist in one of those states. That's very weird. We need to explain how that can be, because it seems as though information is traveling faster than light. 
or as Einstein said, there's some hidden variable, but that's been shown to be wrong by Bell's theorem. So there is no hidden variable. Uh, it, it is actually the way it appears to be. Okay, so those are some of the weirdness things we need to explain about quantum, you know, the quantum weirdness. The step nature of, of anything that's quantum, that's why we call them quantum, because they have the step nature. That is, they're, they're, as if they're, they're acting as bits of information, like in a computer digital world. That's digital physics, why, how, and how it came about. The, how, how it is that particles, particles can exist as merely a wave function as far as their, um, their existence in space. They exist that way until a measurement is made. Then they begin to exist as a particle and act as a particle. Prior to that, the, there's no particle there. How and why is that possible? Why is that so? Even in the digital, digital universe, why would that be the case if we come to that conclusion? How can information seem to travel faster than the speed of light? How can this mathematical correlation this probability function somehow be unaffected by time and, and space is another way to word that. And um, there was another weirdness I wanted to cover. Just a second. Let me grab this. The other drawings I made in the previous videos, which should remind me. Oh yeah, the randomness. Um, why would there be randomness? Why would there be randomness in in particles? Right, so um, remember when once you take a measurement and you change its momentum, its momentum now it has a new momentum, but it's random within this function within this area. It, we know we know the new momentum is going to be somewhere w within that range, but it's going to be it's random what range it is. Same thing with the double slit experiment. Why is it that the particle once you collapse away function continues to have a randomness to it? It'll either end up here or here, but not. You don't, you don't, you can't predict which one. There's always that randomness to it. Why is there this randomness in nature? Why must there exist complete randomness in nature? Why isn't nature completely deterministic? It, which this is very difficult for determinists to actually get around. Uh, the ones that want to believe that that reality is truly deterministic. How does consciousness play a role in all this? Perhaps that'll help us better understand the the answers to these questions. So digital physics offers the answer to all of these problems and, and many many other problems in physics and philosophy with time and space and, and Zeno's paradox and this sort of thing. So let's add a couple more problems to this series because this is going to be in a series rather than just you know one video. The other, there's a couple of paradoxes here. One is Zeno's paradox with the arrow. So if I shoot an arrow in the air and I know its trajectory is going to go like this and it's going to land over here, in order to get to this stage here, it starts from here, this is where it's shot, and it gets over here and lands in the dirt. But in order to get to that stage, it has to reach the halfway point first. But in order to reach the halfway point, it has to reach the halfway point between there and there, and the halfway point between there and there, and the halfway point, and the halfway point, and the halfway point, halfway point. And if you represent, represent this as numbers, you never reach the halfway point. It can go on forever because you start with, let's say, um, in fact, you can do this very quickly on, on the calculator. So you have the um, halfway point. My phone is going off. Um, it's a restricted number, so I'm not going to answer it. So you have the halfway point, which will be 0.5, right? Divide that by 2. You have 0.25. Divide that by 2. You have 0.125. Divide that by 2. 0.065. Divide that by 2. 0.03125, and so forth. And you keep getting a smallest per number. And you just get zeros, you know, 0.0000 like that, right? So you can never actually reach the uh, the halfway point. And so Zeno said, well, if the arrow can never truly reach the halfway point, then the arrow can never actually get over here. That's the paradox, because we see the arrow does get over there. Zeno, one way, one way to get around this is saying that space and time aren't real things. They're not real entities. And so we're going to show how this paradox is explained with the with an idea of the digital universe. And then I'll get into my actual philosophy, which is similar to a digital universe, but not quite. Another one is, what if you have Achilles, a really fast running dude, right, and a turtle, and the turtle's over here somewhere. Okay, I'm just doing really lame drawings, even though I'm an artist. Um, and let's say they're running at certain speeds, and they're running at certain speeds so that right now the turtle is exactly, let's say, a half mile in front of Achilles. So let's say this is one half of a mile, like so. Um, hopefully you can see that from way over there, because I'm kind of far away from the camera. And then 
by the time the turtle gets half of one half, so one fourth, this is weird writing from this angle, Achilles, by the time Achilles gets here, where the turtle was, the turtle is over here, right? And so in order for Achilles, by the time Achilles traverses that one fourth area and gets here, the turtle is half of that, which is one eighth. And by the time Achilles reaches the one eighth mark, the turtle is Oops, I didn't draw that right. That should be like half that, which is one sixteenth, right? And so it keeps going like that. And and, the, and there, and if you do the math again, it's kind of the same thing. That Achilles should never be able to catch the turtle because the turtle is always going to be one half step ahead. But yet we see Achilles does pass the turtle, and he passes the turtle exactly at one minute. If you, if this if this counted for thirty seconds, exactly one minute later he'll pass the turtle. Well, how is that possible? Also, you have Thompson's lamp. This is another paradox, a modern version. Thompson lamp goes like this. If I have a light bulb and it's in the on position at one minute, and 30 seconds later I turn the light bulb off, this is that 30 seconds, and then half of that, so 15 seconds after that, I turn the light bulb back on. That's at 15 seconds. And half of 15 seconds, 7.5 seconds, I turn the light bulb back off. And then I turn the light bulb back off at half of that, and I turn the light bulb back on. Exactly at one minute is the light bulb on or off. And there's no way to know, because you approach that infinite amount of numbers you can't do the calculations for, and then you know you can't even flip the, the switch fast enough. And even if you say the switch can somehow, you know, switch at faster than the speed of light, you still won't be able to calculate whether the light is off or on. That's that's the paradox. It's very strange because you would think that if you kept going off and on and you could flip the lights fast enough, you would have a definite state whether it's off or on. But according to this paradox, there is no definite state. You can't know the definite state whether it's off or on. It's like an uncertainty principle. And so, basically, when you get into the very small, you get into uncertainty principles. Probably, because if the digital universe is correct, you, when you get small enough, you reach this gap. In other words, when you look at time, how am I going to explain this digital universe? As far as time and space is con concerned, and, and this might be where the Planck time might be kind of accurate, and Planck length. I'm going to get a new piece of paper. So these are the problems we're going to be addressing and I'm going to start to address them now with the digital universe. So the digital universe basically says, uh, it's not called the digital universe, if you look it up it's going to be called digital physics and digital philosophy. So look up both of those, they're very interesting to read about. You can just read the wiki, part, wiki particle, wiki, the wiki articles if you just kind of want to sort of understand what they're about. Okay. Let's say time looks continuous to us, like so. Just as a curved line on this screen looks continuous to you, but it's really not. That curved line looks continuous, but it's not continuous. On your computer screen, there's a bunch of individual pixels, little squares, that are making that line look like a line. It looks like a continuous line with infinite, with infinite spaces, but it's really not. If I were to blow that line up huge, it would look more like this. And I'm not doing this accurately, but you know, look more like that. You know, you'd be able to see the individual pixels. And each individual pixel, you know, whatever. Okay, so what the pixels wouldn't actually be angled like that. The pixels would actually be like this. So they'd be like blocks, you know. Anyway, so you get the idea. The point is that that's how it it's actually is on your computer screen. If you if you have a good microscope, not a microscope, but a good enough magnifying glass, you might even be able to see the individual pixels. Definitely with a, a really high powered magnifying glass or very low powered uh, ma uh, microscope, you'd be able to see the individual pixels. Okay, so let's say this this line is representing time, and time and space. It's, 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 actually, it's representing space time. So it's not just representing time. It's not just representing the movement of of objects moving forward, but it's also representing the actual space the objects take up. Let's say we have this ball, and this ball is traveling in this direction. When we play it like a movie, the ball looks like it just goes wee in one continuous line. But if we slow down the movie, we can actually see the ball is taking leaps. It's going in steps because it's it's going exactly at 24 frames a second if it's a, a movie theater type movie. So let's say it's going exactly 24, let's say, let's say it's even going 60 frames a second, it really doesn't matter. Let's say it's going 60 frames a second, my time's up, I'll come back with this uh, series. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed what, what we see so far, please click on the thumbs up button. Appreciate it. Uh, leave questions and stuff in the comments. What do you what do you think of the digital universe so far? What do you think of these problems, these these paradoxes, these problems in physics? Can can you answer them?